I'm Larry Pancho Brown, and this is a David Charles ENT production. What's up, people? This your boy David Charles, and we back again. This is another David Charles ENT production, and today, man, I have a special, special guest for you. Um, a living legend in the city of Baltimore. He ain't gonna say, you know, he's too modest to say it, but I'm gonna say it for him. You know, a living legend in the city of Baltimore. Um, somebody I've been looking up to for years, man. Like when you think about uh, excellence, black excellence, black art. Uh, this man right here is the definition of black excellence, black art. Um, I want to introduce to you my good brother, big bro, Larry Poncho Brown. How you feel, man? I feel fantastic, brother. I feel fantastic. Good to be alive. Good to be alive. Yes, sir. You know, so I mean, I appreciate you coming to my home on short, short notice, man. Um, you know, I mean, you're one of those people that I always, you know, keep an eye on because you're always doing amazing things, and 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 you know, and you've always set the set the landmark i mean as far as like what what it is to be an excellent a great black artist so you know if you don't mind just kind of uh you know sharing with the viewers like how did you get get started um as far as artists concerned like how did you get in the game well you know i i would love to start off with a big old accolade but the bottom line is i am actually the byproduct of a teenage parent that, that had uh given up his his dream of being an artist to have me Wow. So my dad was an artist, uh, very frustrated, came through the 60s. Uh, and uh, the, the, set, the, the, the 50s and the 60s didn't have a lot of opportunities for artists at all. Right. Especially in Baltimore. Right, okay. So here I was watching this man who was self-taught do all these paintings in the house. At that time, he was still in high school. Right. Okay. So, you know, I'm imitating what he was doing. And, and, and then later on, I would go on to go to the same school he went to right. which we both went to called vocational technical high school yep. and I can't tell you man that experience uh, outside of the Baltimore experience was probably one of the most um, man it was a life altering situation going to Carver namely because Baltimore had a couple of places where black folks could go to learn a trade Right. They had Markethal, you had Carver and a couple other places but primarily those were the main two Yeah. and so you learn a trade you was able to Probably you could you could leave 12th grade and go right into the industry if you want. If you want to start a business, you could. The skill set you learned at that school really would set you up for the rest of your life. Right. And okay. so here I was. Um, my dad was very frustrated as an artist, and he eventually moved into printing. Right. And so I followed his footsteps, went into car into commercial art. There you go. So there I was in commercial art, learning how to do signs and painting signs. Now. No, we had the same teacher, Chanel Alpha. Yeah, that's so man. Rest in peace. Because uh, I, I, I can tell you, and you already know, if it wasn't for Chanel, neither one of us would be alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we both had one foot in the street, and one foot in the school. Exactly. And he was able to kind of guide you. Yeah. He yeah. knew where you were coming from, so yeah. he kind of knew how to get at you to get the best response. Yeah. So, uh -huh. you know, the program we were at Carver, you learned lettering for three years. It was a three program right so here i am I, I come into it at that point you know you remember barbara uh thomas yeah barbara thomas was probably pound for pound the best sign painter in baltimore city wow. she was she was truly the fastest sign painter in town okay so here i come in 10th grade he assigns me to barbara thomas wow and so he was already looking out checking out the stuff i was doing and what i was into right but now i get assigned to the lady who really knows sign painting yeah so where it takes most people their junior year, mm -hmm. uh, their freshman, junior year, and then in senior year they would get work study. I came in the first year and, and Barbara had me shaped up in three months. Wow. And most kids took a three-year program. Yeah. I learned it in three months. Three months. And so they had to decide for the first time whether they were going to put a 10th grader on work study. Wow. Because I, I pretty much had ex has exhausted what I could have learned in the classroom at that point. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they took a chance, they put me in and assigned me to Washington Signs. Here I was, 14 years old, painting signs. Yeah, so you feel bad. So man. that was my background, <laughs> man. That was my fast forward. That changed my life. I mean, I, I could get back and tell you about my experience at Liberty Elementary with, uh, with David Humphreys. 
Yeah, yeah. But David Humphreys put his foot in my behind. He was like, look, stop playing in my class. And then he would make me do uh, school-oriented stuff with my art talent. Right. He was the first person to recognize my art talent. He was the first one to let me know, yo, you need to stop playing because I was a class clown. Yeah. This is what you need to start looking at doing. Wow. And so he would punish me. If I got in trouble in class, he would punish me. He would keep me after school. He would make me do bulletin boards and sets for the school uh, assemblies and all that kind of stuff. So by the time I got the car, well, you know, Chanel Alpha was six, 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 seven. Yeah. I had two dominant males back to back that got a piece of my behind. That's crazy. Going from junior high school into Carver. So I think that really set the stage because around that time, my mother and my father had separated. Right. And so that was another factor that I was dealing with going into Carver. Right. So, but in the program, I never liked lettering. Right. I was a closet illustrator. Okay. And so illustrate, a closet illustrator means I was painting and nobody actually knew I could paint. Mm -hmm. uh, Chanel knew I could paint. But he told me up front, man, this is the one thing I I locked it in my brain, man. And he said to me, white folks are not going to let you do the kind of art you want to do. Mm. But if you learn how to paint signs, you will never have to worry about eating. Mm. That set real heavy on me, man. Because you got to remember that I saw my dad get frustrated because of no outlet. And here I was hearing this from this guy who pretty much he had trained most of the best artists in the city. Right. Telling me this. Yeah. So I kind of locked it away and said, okay, well, maybe I will be a sign painter. Right. Well, before long, man, it, it just, it, I never liked it. It paid my way through college. I went to the Merlin Institute College of Art. Never intended to go to college. Got a couple scholarships through Carver to go to, to, my, to MICA. And when I got to MICA, it was funny because, you know, I didn't know what a counselor was. I didn't know what a uh, scholarship was. That's how, that's how, like, green I was, man. I didn't know none of this shit. It right. It was like... I just got thrust into this world and had to decide whether I was going to continue my education and go to MICA. So I went to MICA and immediately found out that my reading level was behind what? and okay. that my money was too short. Right. Oh, wow. So I had to make a decision what I was going to do. Either wow. I was going to continue or I was going to cop out. And I just never had a cop out spirit. So I stuck in there and it changed my life because it changed my perspective. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing to me is I never knew that you were also taught by Mr. Humphreys, because I was taught by Mr. Humphreys in Garrison. So we kind of had the same kind of path, especially when you talk about mentorship and teachers. Exactly. Yeah, so, um, and they were some strong dudes. It was some jewels that Chanel dropped on me that I ain't really realized until I got, mm -hmm. okay, with a dog. <laughs> See, what happens when you had kids, the stuff he say to you resonate. Yeah. yeah. Chanel walked up to me when I first came to his yeah. class. Right. And this dude... He looked at me and he says, man, you a descendant of kings. And I said, oh, this motherfucker is crazy already. Right, right. You know, where is this coming from? He did more to change my consciousness mm. than I think anybody. He had prepped me perfectly. I was like, I went to, you know, I was a Baptist, went to Whalen Baptist Church down the street. That was my background, man. My family was very, uh, you know, religious family. Right, okay. Uh, they have a religious back line. Uh, but I was kind of drifting away, and by the time I met Chanel, man, he was telling me about um, black people was in Egypt, and I mean, he was telling me all this stuff that was just blowing up my head. Right. But at the same time, the stuff he was telling me was starting to show up in my artwork. There you so go. here I was drawing these black comic book characters with big old afros, and they was killing all of the Marvel characters. And, I, and finally, on my birthday, he gave me a wall in the class to do. Wow. And I did this character that I stole from my dad called Cronus. Okay. And he was strangling the hawk. And that's how I kind of got serious about art. Yeah. And that, that kind of set the stage. So by the time I left Carver, it was just a whole new world available to me. Wow. Wow. So you've been in the game for a minute. You've been you've been a, a, a artist that has has pretty much been self you know, maintained. Like you've, you've been running your business for over got to be over 30 years well it is this is my 40th year as a professional artist wow and so that means i got my first job when i was 14 i opened my first business when i was 17 so uh the entrepreneurial path is something you learn to carve it it's not like i did something special you right. went to that school you had a trade right and the one thing you have to learn immediately is how to hustle and so you know we from the streets so yeah hustle no wasn't that hard to do no not we at just all. needed discipline right and so what chanel did for me and just like david humphreys did for me is they supplied the disciplinary part because I kind of needed it. Right. You know, I came from a 
family where I never was in any, any kind of trouble. Yeah, right. But then I got tempted by stuff as I got to Carver. Oh, yeah. And so they, they stayed on me. They right. stayed on me with the discipline side of it. And that also carried over into my work because I was always drawing and painting, man. That, 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 was my, that was my childhood friend. Your therapy, no doubt. You know, back then everybody had one TV in the living room. Right. You know, couldn't go in unless you had company. Right. No, everybody didn't have a TV in their room. And if you did, it was black and white. Right. You know, I had hand-me-down TVs and all that kind of stuff. Gotcha. So most of the time, it was just me, and it was just me and some paper. And the one thing my dad and my mother always made sure I had was paper. There you go. So this is, you know, I mean, you've been doing an amazing job over the last 30-plus years. But, you know, I, I remember you did have a setback. Everything wasn't always great um, mm -hmm. when you think about... Because I know that you had the uh, studio right down the street from where my mom and my dad, where I grew up from, um, on Haywood Avenue. And eventually that caught fire. Could you kind of tell us how you were able to kind of rebound and kind of continue to persevere through one of it? Because to be perfectly honest with you, it was a time where I lost a lot of my artwork. But to compare my, because you do work. I mean, like I, I may do 20 pieces a year, if that. I know that you are the you're the type of artist that can do 20 in a, in a week, twenty in a month. So you you, you putting in work. So I could have I could only imagine the 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 workload that you had in that studio that burnt down to the ground. Well, I set the stage for you, man. Uh, I, I'll, I'll get back to it later on. But I met Dick Gregory, okay, and he was the first celebrity to endorse my artwork. Okay, and so at around that same time, I was busy trying to figure out, well, how can I do this? How can I do my artwork? I'm doing everybody else's work. I don't like graphic design. I don't like sign painting. So I started actually doing more of my artwork when I got out of school. Wow. And so um, if you can imagine, I built this career, man, and it blew up all of a sudden. In 1985, uh, because my dad was a printer, I was printing business cards and stuff in the kitchen when I was 12 years old. So I was very familiar with the printing industry. Wow. And so the key thing that happened to me once I got out of college was that I was uh, curious about publishing my work. And because I had a printing background as a result of my dad, I reluctantly went in and published some of my prints and started selling my prints. This is like 1982, 3, 4. Wow. And so that changed everything because now here I was able to make my work accessible to people. Mm. So before I knew it, man, I went to a trade show in New York City um, quite by accident because I had gone up to, to a portfolio review. A friend of mine told me a portfolio review was happening in New York City where people from S Ebony Essence and Jet Magazines was looking for illustrators. Mm. So I said, oh man, this is my shot. I'm ready. I had a portfolio with about 2,000 pieces in it. Wow. This is going to be, and I'm going to go tear this up. And I had gone through a lot of portfolio reviews in the area in Washington, Baltimore area and everybody kept getting they would look at me man be stuck like well, what the fuck are you doing here and they wouldn't even be looking at the work <laughs> so I had gone through that so much I figured oh man New York this is going to be it I'm going to go in here man I'm right. going to knock this portfolio of you well I got there and the same thing happened White dude was overseeing the portfolio reviews and he's sitting there flipping looking at me like all the other motherfuckers had looked at me over the years wow and wow. I said damn man I came too far I had just enough money to make it to New York what am I going to do, man? Right. Is color going to really stop me? Chanel's statement, is that shit real? Right, exactly. So I jumped into the bus, man, to come back home. And I, I kid you not, man, I drove past the Javis Convention Center. And people were jumping out the building, man. They had canvases. They were jumping in the limos. They were jumping in the taxis. And I told the bus driver, let me off right here. Right. <laughs> Just let me off right here. So I right. kind of moseyed over, man. And as soon as I got to the door, I asked this Asian dude coming. I said, es excuse me, sir, what's happening here? He says, oh, Art Expo, largest art show in the United States. And he jumped into a taxi, man, and took off. Mm. And so I, I'm still kind of hesitant to go in. Another person came out. I said, well, what do you have to have to get into the show? And they told me just a business card and you need this. It was $20 to get in. So, man, I registered to get in the show at the last hour of the show. Wow. And that one move changed my life. Wow. Because you're talking about thousands of booths of art. Mm. I'm running through the like O.J. Simpson trying to see as much as I can see before this hour is up. And even my brain was clicking with that same sentence about what Chanel said to me. Right. Everybody in there was white, Asian, whatever else. But there was only three companies there that was black. Okay. So by the time I left, I mean, my feet wouldn't touch the ground. It's like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out what it's going to take 
to do this show, and this is what I'm going to do. And man, within two years, I wow. set my booth up at Art Expo. Wow. Changed my life because I didn't realize my drive to get it done was so strong that I didn't realize what I was doing. Okay. Sometimes you run on just pure energy, man, right? Yeah. So I didn't realize about going to a trade show, which is what that was, right. that the whole industry was coming to this show. Wow. So when most artists is knocking on doors and trying to be seen, here, because I did that backwards move, right. and I went in as a publisher, Right. They the businesses were coming to me. So the trick was then, do I act like I'm the artist, or do I act like I'm just a company? Right, right. So I came and I acted like I was a company. Folk were asking about the work, and man, they started ordering my work. And it took them a long time to realize it was me. They would come by and say, hey, man, when's your boss coming by? And I'm going, he'll be back tomorrow. Wow. You know? <laughs> That's and so, cool. I, I, so that's how I got started. And so most artists, while they were trying to figure out how to get their work out, I had reluctantly made this move right. that kind of put me in a position that they were trying to figure out, well, what the hell did this boy do? Right. You know, right. so now I've got hundreds of galleries ordering my work. I did that first show with five prints. Mm. You understand? Right. And I had never paid that much for a booth. I think the booth at that point was like, Three thousand dollars. I had this was nineteen eighty five, eighty six. Three thousand dollars. That was more money. Man, I borrowed money. I might have stole some money. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did whatever I could do yeah. to make sure I was in that show, and I had a good support system of people that wanted to see me in it. That's amazing. So if you can imagine, all this is happening. I blew up real fast. Right. And so to come back to your question about the fire. Imagine you done, you done socked all your money back into the business and you're starting to build a portfolio. And mm -hmm. I had a, a studio space, it was about, uh, it was like 5,000 square feet all right. together. And, uh, but everything I had in there was my art. So all of my art was there, oh. you know. So you can imagine at the height of your popularity, just when you get ready to get a return on your investment, having a fire come through to take care of everything. Wow. And that's what happened to me. No insurance. I had a couple of uh, red flag signs that I need to get out of the building. Right. Had some water damage a couple of months prior to when the fire actually happened. Where my land, my landlord said, hey, look, well, I'll help you with this claim, but you need to get your own insurance. Right. So I'm calling people up and, man, I tell you, I had a friend of mine that was a fire inspector, Mike Maven. Shout out. Mike Maven used to come and have lunch with me at my studio. Right. And the whole time he was there, he would be looking at the building like, you know, if this sucker <laughs> ever catch on fire, you can, you can, it's over. Oh, man. And so that actually happened. Mm. Mm. You know, so the whole Holland Street Exchange building was a, a eight-story, one-city, block-long building that burned down in uh, November the 10th of 1995. I remember like it was yesterday. And it changed my life because here I was at a point where I was supposed to be really blowing up. And it hit me so hard, man, because I had to start over. And, and I had no concept to start over. But luckily, I had done enough in the business where, man, I can't tell you how, uh, how wonderful people were, man. Our artist family was, was tremendous, man. I had artists sending me money. They were sending me mailing lists. They were sending, I mean, I had collectors that were sending me artwork back. They were sending prints back to me. Mm. It was just, man, that first year, I literally, people must have sent me close to $80,000 that year. Because wow. I was in a deep depression after that happened. I can you know? imagine. But it, what it did was I was young enough to understand how things work, how fragile things are. Like I say, the water damage situation happened early that year. I was planning to get do a big show in November, December, and move out in January. And then it happened in November. Wow. And in fact, the invitations for the show were on the sofa <laughs> when the place caught on fire. Right. So to have to start over again, I know what that's like. Um... I went through a lot of strife, I went through depression, I went through a whole bunch of other stuff to get to the other side of that. But you know, we go through ups and downs, man. So yeah. um, I've had many ups and downs trying to do this business and just trying to do art and trying to enrich people's lives and, you know, uh, people don't know about those struggles. Yeah, and I, th I just thought it was important to kind of bring that up because, you know, when, when I speak about your ac accolades and, and your level of consistency over 30, 40 plus years, you know, you know, it's it's just amazing to hear your story of perseverance because you got people that wouldn't wouldn't be able to come back from that. I mean, right. when you think about your workload and I mean, your work is amazing and you have your own specific signature style that is, you know, 
cater to you know just your growth and development as an artist um and you know to me it was just remarkable you know and and to you know i, I think i came to your studio last year maybe and it's like you never you never missed a beat <laughs> the beat but trust me man I went through um, a year and a half of serious depression right uh, I, com I considered suicide wow I had a young son um, that I had to take care of uh, I, I just went through a bunch of stuff so right, right. I mean this whole thing about perseverance man you know it's not just about artists it's everybody yeah. black folks are able to endure a lot of shit <laughs> oh yeah absolutely and so i just feel like that's what i was able to do it took me three years to rebuild it um and um, and it wasn't perfect i think that that uh incident uh set me back 10 years i don't think i ever actually got over it right um uh, i think that um it caused its own scars but at the end of the day uh, man, I'm about work, bro. I mean, you know, you say you do 20 pieces a year, man. I'm doing 120 a year. I've done a quarantine last January where I finished 60 pieces in the month of January. So wow. when I'm working, I'm working. Right. Uh, but I'm not trying to also paint the picture. That's all I do, you know, because there's an administrative side to me. There's a business side to me. So when I'm not doing the creative, then I'm doing the business side. So right. when you see me doing all my own marketing. I do my own representation. I do just about everything, every aspect of my business I do, right. from the publishing to the distribution. It's not easy to do, but you got to remember, I had a graphic design background. Right. I had a sign painting background. Right. I had an illustrative background. So you put all that together, man, I know how to do websites, I know how to do editing and film, and so you just become this multimedia kind of a, 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 a source, and that's kind of what I, I view myself as. You know, Charles, uh, Paul Goodnight is a very well-known artist, and he says to me, now I'm an image maker. And I take that responsibility very seriously because, you know, it's not like this is in a vacuum. I'm not just doing pretty pictures of flowers and shit. Right. I'm doing things that make black folks look beautiful. Absolutely. Because when I was coming through school, there was nothing up on the walls that looked like me. That's dope. And the few things that I did do was representations of everybody else. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I take my job very seriously, man. With the moment I decided I'm going to do some pieces that are a reflection of my people, the first piece I did that was on that subject was a piece I called Black is Black. And it's got three different shades of black people's faces. That piece became my most popular piece to date. Mm. For the first time I tried to make a statement about right. black people. It's got a light complected face up front, dark complected face in the back. The title's Black is Black. It just says, hey, look, we're all the same. You and know I, what I'm saying? And I thought, I mean, when I was a kid, um, my Aunt Jeanette had your work in her living room. But then she also had prints. I don't know if she had went to one of your shows or not. But she had prints of your artwork, and I believe black and black, black, black and black was one of them. Right. Um, and I remember just looking at the pieces and staring at them. And um, and I actually at that time, you know, I was I was you know drawing and, and creating as well. And I remember kind of sketching it out, you know, what I'm saying, and kind of duplicating or trying to do do what you did or whatever the case may be. So. I mean, it's just a testament to how far and how long you've been you've been doing what you've been doing. So um, yeah, but that piece was one of the first pieces on the African American art market that dealt with colorism. You know, we talk about light complexed blacks, dark complexed blacks, and the struggle within that group. You know, all races right. have a colorism issue, not just black people. Exactly. And so when I was coming up through the '60s and '70s, being dark skinned was not popular. Right, exactly. It's light skin, good hair, X, Y, Z, you know the game. Right. Uh, when I, by the time I got to college, it completely inverted over. Right. But black is black really essentially speaks to that, 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 that whole story. Wow. What does that mean? 
Exactly. And so I had never really done works that meant anything before. So right. it was the first time I did something that I felt spoke to something that I saw happening in my community that people resonated with. Right. And so and when I first started taking it to distributors, they didn't want to they didn't want to print it. They said it was done in Airbrush, it wasn't a traditional medium, it was too graphic, all those things that wow. define who I was. So I went and printed it myself. And that's why you And then when I printed it myself, people were selling 100 at a time. 200 at a time. Man, that piece is in literally 200,000 homes right now. Mm. That's, that's how popular the piece is, and that's how long it's been around. That's and so, um, you know, that's that's the power of art. You just never know what folks are going to resonate to. Never never know. So I always, you know, one, one thing that I've always been fascinated about, because myself as an artist, I have a process. But to kind of understand what your process is, what makes Poncho, aside from the business, but what what makes you sit down or what inspires Larry Poncho Brown to be Larry Poncho Brown creatively? Like what makes is it music or could you tell us a little bit about If I thought about it I'd be spooked out and I'd be doing nothing. But I can tell you the baseline of what I do is I, I try to put myself in a state of nothingness. That means I'm not worried about the phone. I'm not worried about where, where I'm supposed to be. You know, I tell all artists when they're trying to figure out what is what being a creative is is that we're time travelers. I mean, we can go into a room and turn on some music and sit down to a blank whatever. Right. And then three, four hours later, we done tripped off somewhere and came back and then something's in that space. Yeah. It's a lot of power. I try not to overlook it, but at the same time, being able to be creative is a strong thing. Whether you're a photographer, a sculptor, whatever, it's the same energy. And musicians use the same energy too. Right. And it's not uncommon for musicians to be artists or vice versa. Yeah. Because we're using that same energy. And that includes writers as well. Right. And so I think the whole time when people try to make me feel special, I'm trying to tell folks it is not uncommon for African Americans to be talented, man. This stuff is DNA based. Yeah. I'm telling you. Right. If you think you all that and you're the most original bag of chips around, take your ass to Africa. You're going to see two people that look like you. And the stuff you think is so original, you're going to see it depicted there when you get there. And you're going to say, what the hell just happened? Right. It's because we have this DNA coding that shows up in our work and in our creativity, too. Right. And so it took me a while to realize that even from my own father. Because my father wasn't the most nurturing guy when it came to me being an artist. Because he didn't want to see me go through the pain right. that he went through. Yeah. You know. But I can't erase the elements in my father's artwork that actually show up in my work even today. Right. You know. Right, right. So it, that's that's the deep part. And then when I start talking back when we start talking about Chanel Alford and his whole Afrocentric philosophy, that was so embedded in me that it began to come out in my work too. Right. So I just think that whatever you do, you gotta do it in a way where it's gonna educate somebody. Right. Now could you talk about some of the, the, the major co collaborations and, and the great artists that you've also worked with because I know that you have a special connection with, like, if I'm not mistaken, Charles Bibbs. Um, but could you tell me about the relationships that you've uh, established throughout your, your years of being an artist and some uh, signature collaborations that you may have done? And, may, and it even, you know, and just to kind of make it a two-part question, even some collaborations or people that you may, may want to work with in the future. Well, you know, what I will say is that the art community is so, they're so tight and that we don't actually work together like we should, mm -hmm. but we're tight. Like I told you, the experience I went through with the fire and how the support system I had. So if you can imagine me being this, this, this gun hole young guy from Baltimore, I get into this national environment. Most of my, excuse me, my peers were 15 to 20 years older than me. Right. And they all embraced me. They shared the information. They told me what to do, what not to do, what worked and what didn't work. And so, you know, you're standing on that whole concept of standing on the shoulder of your ancestors. I don't think I really played heed to that. Right. But that's basically what it was. So, yeah, Charles Biz, Paul Goodnight, all these cats, um, Joe Holston, you name uh, Cynthia St. James. I met Varney Honeywood. All the folks who was on the Cosby show, the works with people. I know these people. They were my friends. Wow. And so to have that kind of a fraternity, sorority combined, it's a, it's a strong place to be. And I, I count myself to be very blessed to have met those people. And uh, as far as collaborations go, I've done a lot of collaborations with other, with other artists. Charles Bibbs, I'm probably most familiar with. He's probably my closest artist friend. 
and we may have done maybe 20 or 30 collaborations over the years. We've published probably four. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do a lot of original works that are collaborations and I've done them with a host of other artists and some artists are angry with me right now because I got about five pieces at the studio right. that I need to put my input on but that's a phenomenon it's just like musicians artists are doing it too they're working with each other wow okay so to, to kind of talk about like things from my personal lens like um, when I was young I used to get criticized um, heavily and attacked for a lot of the subject matter um, and a lot of my artwork from like a lot of the violent pieces that I did, um, such as Be More Get Careful, The Joint with the Guns in the Mouth, and Rest in Peace. And, you know, and it was really my way of just expressing what we go through um, within the inner city and, and a lot of things that I personally saw. And a lot of it was connected to just hip hop culture. A lot of the music I listened to back then influenced a lot of the work that I created. Exactly. So, so I wanted to ask from a creative perspective. Like, what do you think about the state of hip hop? Has it taken a step forward or taken a step back? Um, um, the level of influence that it has on the culture. Well, I mean, we could have a discuss. That would take another two hours to talk about the influence of hip hop. Okay. I mean, I came along. The hip hop movement came in when I was right, you know, just in in college. Right. So I got to hear what it sounded like in the beginning, Sugar Hill Gang and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Up to. Uh, you know, when LL Cool J and all these other guys came in, when, uh, you know, Heavy D and, 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 and all these other, and Queen Latifah came in, and then, yeah. you know, then you got uh, NWF, and you got, you got all these people, man. Yeah, yeah. So, now it's different. It's right. totally different. Yeah. I mean, I listen to guys like Kendrick Lamar, man, fantastic. Yeah. But I can listen to some of this other stuff, and I'm lost. But that, you gotta remember, I'm a baby boomer, man. I was born in 1962. Right. So, my, that's my son's music. Yeah. And so by him being a musician, by him being in the rap, yeah, I have my own opinion. But what I also know is that the work you was doing was a reflection of the community, just like the, the music is a reflection of the community. Right. And does that mean it's dissolving today? Right. Well, you know, listen to some old Ozzy brothers. Right. And listen to the lyrics. Listen to some of those old songs and hear how sensual they were, hear what the subject was, hear how they were dealt with. It might not be what it is today. Yeah, right. But it is still... A reflection of the times. Right. And my artwork is a reflection of the times. And right. you may not find it in my work because my work is about building up people. It's about building up families. It's about showing complete families. You know, most black art is women and children. Right. Exactly. You don't see a lot of men pieces. So I started doing men pieces. Right. The pieces you were doing were speaking to what's happening right here in the area, man. Right. And it was in your face. The kids who saw it re could reflect on it. Other folks probably couldn't, but that's the point is. Who are you doing it for? Yeah. It's coming through you anyway. Exactly. You can't claim what it is. Right. You know, so look at what's happening with hip hop now. You got more people now managing their own business, doing their own music. It's a whole different ball game. So if you apply that to the arts now and you apply that to social media and what a person can now do to put themselves on another platform, yeah. that's the conversation I would rather have Yeah. than the influence of what's happening with some trap. Because trap music is going gonna, gonna to change to something else again. Yeah, and time. You know, the word nigga ain't going nowhere. Right. You know, the, the question is, I don't know if you can look at my work and see the word nigga. Right. It's in there. You just probably wouldn't know which pieces it was in. Okay. So you never know what artists are thinking when they do certain things. Right. Just like the hip hop artists are saying one thing and it's always an undercurrent of something else. Wow. So I try not to get real caught up in the surface, but what I do know is that it's bringing us down. Right, right. If it's not lifting us up, Mm -hmm. Then it's bringing us down, and so if I can, if if my uh, eighteen year old daughter's listening to that, <clears throat> it's it's a different situation because of the way it's being verbalized. So I think we have a responsibility. But hey, we're being inundated by media twenty four seven. Man, I was dumb compared to what it is now. Social net, we plugged in all damn day long. Right. The news is switched now. Now we know the news can be fake. Before we thought the news was always correct. Now we just found out last year the news is fake. Yeah. And can be fake. And yeah. can be influenced. Yeah. So I think our awareness is is moving so fast right now that people really don't have a clue how much we're digesting right now. Right. And so that's where the arts become important to me. Right. Is that it kind of it slows things down and make you focus on what's really important. Right. You know. And you got to say something. Like okay. I'm waiting for them to say something. I'm right. waiting for any artist to say something. Are they supposed to say something with every every song, every painting? No. Mm -hmm. But they're supposed to say something somewhere. And that's my only perspective on it. Um, from a, a managerial perspective, 
hip hop has changed the music industry by leaps and bounds. They oh, yeah. came and made that a genre, and now it's being supported globally. Right. They are now have a, a larger economic stake in what they do than they ever had before. Matter of fact, some of the things they're doing, if our form of R and B and pop artists had done it, they would be trillionaires by now. Yeah, and so the business structure is there, but it's about a consciousness. Mm -hmm. So now when I go to shows like the Essence Music Festival, I get to really see what's happening with the consciousness of our people, man. Right. We got a phone in our hands, so we walk into the booth now. You shoot a picture of my artwork, you didn't ask me, but that's okay. I get that now. Right. You ask me I'm online. Right. I give you a business card. You haven't even experienced my work now. You done walked off. Right. It's, it's like you're desensitized because we have so many distractions. Not only that, they took art out of schools. Mm. They took music out of schools. So now these those same people that are coming through this booth, they don't have art appreciation. They didn't have art classes. They didn't have music classes. And they might have the same money in their pocket as the people before that. Wow. So when we get degraded to the point where we'd be culturally deprived, and that's what's happening now, is that unless you're teaching your kids and passing it on to your kids, mm -hmm. media is going to suck them up. It's not going to be anything you can do about it. I'm fighting that every day to stay relevant as an artist in the front of another generation of people. Right. Because the generation that I appeal to is still there. They're still talking about me. They make me relevant. Right. The, the new generation, they pick up the baton. So this conversation is right within the same lines, man. We got a lot of work to do. But if we're not consciousness building and culture building, then we ain't doing nothing. Right. And that's a, that's a dope con. I mean, that's the truth. You know, that's definitely the truth. I mean, when you think about um, just just genocide as a whole, you know, a lot of it is in the music. You know, a lot of in today's music, a lot of the sexism. I, you uh, know what? I, I would love to say that, but it's not true. It's not just we can't just pick on the music. We can't blame video games. We can't. There's other parts of our consciousness mm -hmm. that don't have nothing to do with those things. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a morality that's built into us, mm -hmm. you know. If that's the case, it would be total anarchy out here. <laughs> right. You know, we got a couple of knuckleheads to show up and act up. But we don't talk about the good things people are doing in the community. We're not talking about the folks that are elevating their, their community. We talk about the fools that's doing crazy stuff. I agree. Look at the news. Mm -hmm. We've been programmed the news for years. They tell you now, so JoJo got shot on the corner. They won't even mention JoJo's name anymore. They tell you the corner that he got shot on, and they won't. They'll tell you whether somebody has, is a suspect or not. So they don't waste it. Fifteen minutes of film sh showing you the sign of the corner where this person got killed. It's totally desensitized, and that's our news right. every day. So we're desensitized like crazy. Mm -hmm. Social networking. Man, we done seen more nasty stuff mm -hmm. in a social networking environment than we ever saw our whole life. Right. Right now. Right. And it, it affects everything. I think the thing that, uh, that I'm concerned with the most is that when you see it so repetitiously, you become jaded to it. Right. I don't want nobody sending me another black man being pulled over on the street to force traffic stop. I don't want to see that anymore. Right. I, I, I've lived it. I've seen some people come out of it in a negative way. Right. I don't need to see it. But that kind of desensitization happens every day. Right. So we can't talk about, we can't blame just music. It's like you can't just blame art. But guess what? Art is one of the few things that's bringing attention to the positive. I will and say even that, if right. it's art that's designed to make you think, right. there's a beauty and there's an essence about it that draws you in. And all you got to do is be quiet and experience it. Yeah, yeah. So there's a big difference between music and what it provides and art and what it provides. But the bottom line is about culture building. Culture building. Please start and reenact culture building. Right, I got you. So that was kind of that was kind of the point that I was trying to make when you talk about the images and what they're branding. You know, when you th when you think about the concept of genocide uh, and you think about the things that they're branding and they're putting on social media, they're putting on the news consistently. That as a whole, when you think about the, the negative connota connotations that are in the music, when you think about what they're 
publicizing in social media. Like you said, they don't talk about the positive but, things. But, but we don't do it. Mm -hmm. You can't keep putting it on other people. When right. you talk about your friends, mm -hmm. you're not saying, uh, mm -hmm. you you know, you, you might do it for the interview. Mm -hmm. You don't say Poncho is out there doing big things when you have a conversation about folks. Right. You're talking about what Knucklehead JoJo did. Mm -hmm. When you talk about your relationships, you're not saying, this one right here really showed me how to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. That's not what people do. They right. talk about the negative. We right. talk about men in our community or what men don't do. Men have been stabbed and, and vilified for centuries. Right, I got you. But they don't talk about men that raise their children. They don't talk about men that just taking care of their family. Right. That's not what we do. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I agree. It's not about just these things that are in place. It's about a human nature thing that happens. We always live by the negative. The world runs on fear. Mm -hmm. The political scene runs on fear. Okay. Everything is connected that way. That's why the arts are so important because it reminds you that there's another thing out there. Right. That you can get a breath of essence from. Right. Yeah, you can. If you, music is all you're doing, yeah, you're gonna be fucked up. If if, if reading books is all you do, you're gonna be fucked up too because there's another whole world out there. You're right. You know. But what about art? Mm -hmm. What about music? We talked about hip hop. Okay. What about the other music? Right. So we got things that's continuously feeding the culture that we have to start elevating. I and we you. need to start talking about the folks who's really doing good things. Because we're not programmed to do that at all. So I can't blame it on one thing. Right. That's why I take what I do seriously. Because I can do a piece in the quiet of my studio and show it to the world. And they can get their own interpretation of it, like it or dislike it. Right. But nine times out of ten, it's going to leave you with a positive feeling. Right. So let me ask you this. from a, you know, and, and I think this is a, a great question to ask you. Um, what, do, what do you think... Where do you think the place of the artist is to affect the change um, of the culture or us as black people? Like, where, where, do you, where do you think the artist's position is? Because, when you know, I've always realized that as pe black people, we follow the artists. When you think about, you know, the trendsetters, the artists have always been the trendsetters as far as what you wear, what's cool and what's not. Even when I was a kid. And this is just from, from you know, my... I disagree. Okay. And that, that's just a personal thing. When you say the art, mm -hmm. most people don't have art incorporated as anything that's important. And especially in this day and age. Now, you can't talk about shoes. The art thing you got on been designed by somebody. So art is in everything that we do. But, you know, art has been around for thousands and thousands of years as long as the planet has been here. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of whether you adhere to it and accept it as part of your culture and accept it as something important. Right. You know, I walk in people's houses right now. I'm alarmed by people that still don't have nothing on the wall. For all of the media we have today, I'm alarmed by people that don't have anything on the wall. When I came up, man, you had Jesus Christ. You had the, 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 uh, Jesus Christ with the red light. You had Jesus Christ with the reef. You had the Last Supper. You had Martin Luther King. If he was real hip, you had Martin Luther King and JFK. That was on your wall at least. Mm -hmm. Now you have a whole slew of things that could be a reflection of you on available to you right. according to your walls. And guess what? We're moving backwards. Right. When I first got into this business in 1985 and you asked 10 people whether they had something now on the wall at home, nine people would say no. Mm -hmm. Now it's inverted. Nine people would say yes. Mm -hmm. But guess what? It's starting to revert back again. Right. Because the kids are not picking up the baton. Mm -hmm. They haven't been planted with the seed. They haven't been told about the legacy of what's been passed down. And so I think that's the culture building piece. Mm -hmm. Culture is culture. It's across the board. But when it starts to break down, mm -hmm. then that means we failed. Mm -hmm. You know, we failed if your children don't adhere or show some of the things you taught them mm -hmm. or embedded in them. You I know? I agree. I agree. But you know, when you think when you think about like I say, for an example, when you have for 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 an example, somebody like a Cardi B, or somebody like a, um, the Migos or what have you, people that are celebrities in that a culture or generation of kids look up to. That's 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 what I'm trying to say. Well, that's the hard of, thing. Right. That's the hard thing because now you could be a celebrity just by having a, a popular social networking site. We've seen whole people become right. billionaires as a result of that kind of environment. Right. We never had that before. You were either a musician. You mm -hmm. were either an actor. You were either somebody that had a talent base. Right. You weren't just popular. Right. And so just being popular, we're now realizing has a price tag. But it's also changing culture because now everybody's gambling on becoming famous. 
and and and, and without talent, they we've proven that you. I'm not talking about Cardi B. Cardi B has her own story. Oh yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? And 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 they're not going to be many Cardi Bs. Mm -hmm. The people you name it now, they've already beat the odds. They they are that one out of a hundred that's going to make it through the fence. Mm -hmm. And you can't look at them because they made it through the fence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a hundred other Cardi Bs that will never get the opportunity who's just as talented as she. But but is. I, I but you know not meaning to cut you off, but the reality of it is is people do look up to people like Cardi Oh, B. I know. I right. agree with you. And, and, and a lot of the messages, and not to say, and I'm not trying to, you know, shit on Cardi at all, but a lot of the messages that a lot of artists put out there are, are, are sexism and are negative messages. You know, I mean, you could sit There's back... There's a bigger thing that's happening, man. It's not just right. about sexism. Sexism been around since the beginning of the music, man. I agree. You know what I'm saying? The problem <clears throat> now is that we, we have a whole culture of people that are in the fucking children. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. Emma fucking chore. That's what I call it. They're immature. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, I don't care how talented you are, if you're immature, mm -hmm. that becomes part of your vibe. That beco right. becomes part of what you pervert pervade the people. Right. And if they look up to you and you're immature, then what's going to happen to them? They're going to start acting what? Fucking immature. Yeah, I agree. So, my thing is that we, we got to be real careful how we group these people and select them and pull the names out. You know, they're all, so, all doing good things. Look, I, anybody that's succeeding in this country, because that's what America's for, all happy to them. But there's a lot of us that are emulating the wrong people. And I we agree. don't know how to look at ourselves, look at our own talent sets yeah. to figure out how to make it through this hustle and grind. Right. And so I'm a byproduct of Baltimore City. I'm proud of Baltimore City. Right. I could have been dead and like a whole bunch of, of my other friends. But my talent has brought me to this point. Right. And I believe my talent made me global. I believe my talent reached out in places that I never could have reached out on my own. Mm -hmm. And so I challenge all people that are creatives, because that's what we all are, creatives, to move up the bar a little bit. There's room. Yeah. No if you doubt. want to cheap out every now and then, fine. That's good. But don't let it just stay on one level of nothingness. It's, right. got, to, it's got to vibrate. Exactly. And right now, our vibrations are low. I agree with that. Now... So could you tell us, you know, before we wrap up, you know, um, could you tell us like what, you know, what, 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 what should we be looking out for from Larry Poncho Brown, you know, going forward? I know you got. I'm glad going. you asked me. That. <laughs> I'm working on a project right now that's completely out of my comfort zone. OK. Uh, I think every now and then you got to do that, too. Right. All right. So um, there's a group of artists that I came up with. OK. That came through the period of 1985 and 2005. Got it. That period is called the golden age of African American art, mm -hmm. and 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 there were certain things that these artists did during that period of time mm -hmm. because of media, the Cosby era, the uh, the Good Times era, that completely changed the art game as we know it. But the thing was, it was pre-social networking, it was pre-internet, so for the most part, it's gone undocumented. Okay. And so now I'm going back and doc doing a documentary mm -hmm. to tell that story working on it now for about a half a year. Wow. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube, Golden Age African American Art. You can see the trailer we just did. It's going to highlight all the people who were part of that movement right. that are still alive today. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to highlight the top artists in the country. Mm -hmm. And so that's my, that's my uh, legacy project. That's what I'm putting all my energy into right now. And I want you all to look out for it because I think it's going to be a piece of information that all artists will be able to use to chart their own trajectory yeah and you heard it here first from the legend that's right <laughs> yeah so um just let you know let people know how they can reach you um poncho if they you know uh whether your social media um your, your email or whatever. all my so social media is the same the art of poncho on twitter uh, uh linkedin facebook instagram the art of poncho uh my website is uh the art of poncho okay and uh, i got a youtube channel the Art of Poncho. Okay. So if you notice the branding, The Art of Poncho. The Art of Poncho. I'm easy to find. Yep. I'm even on Wikipedia if you can't find me. There you go. <laughs> yeah, but it was amazing having you. I appreciate you coming to my home. And we got to do this again. We got to do this again. We got to, I got to check in with you maybe um, quarterly, once, once, twice a year, and just, you know, check with you and come back and tell people what you're doing. But um, I really appreciate that you came through and um, spread some love and gave a, a lot of wisdom and insight about who Larry Poncho Brown is. Well, thank you, brother. It always it helps to come from somebody that knows you. So let's just keep doing about raising that bar, man. Raising that bar. That's what it's all about.
This is a David Charles ENT production. <laughs>